Today on Under the Big Tree, the amazing Buchla 200E modular synthesizer. We have a real treat here uh, at KISS 2018. Thomas DiMuzio, who's a longtime electronic musician and performer, um, is going to take us through his beautiful, gorgeous Buchla 200E synthesizer bit by bit. Hi, Thomas. How are you Hello. doing? Good, man. It's great to be here. That is so nice. I really appreciate it. <sighs> My pleasure. I Look mean, at that beautiful thing. How this... long have you had this instrument for? Probably um, a six years or so. Yeah. Oh. I'm a relative, con a, a new convert, um, but uh, you know, such a system is so inspirational. Just to even look at, you know, it is and beautiful. Touch and wire and config, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a source of endless inspiration. And uh, I'd like to take you through some of these modules, just so you can hear what they do and understand some of the ins and outs of this world, which is very akin to the Euro world. In fact, pretty much the same thing. Um, in fact, uh, these days you can get Buchla 100 modules in Euro rack format. And, um, and I also have a lot of clone modules in this system too, made by other manufacturers that um, model the original analog oscillators that Don Buchla built in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, for example, I'm starting off with the 258V, which was uh, made by Mark Verbos, and this is um, an old original, uh, a clone of an original 258 module, which is all analog through and through. And what we have here is just the sound going straight to the output. I've got some frequency modulation going. I've got the wave shapes up on triangle. Now we're down to a sine wave, just to sweep it. Get a nice analog tone there. And one of my favorite one of my favorite things to do is to do frequency modulation and just sending the output of one to the input of the other and cross modulating back from the output of one to the input of the second oscillator. So that all happens on one on one module. This You've happens, got two oscillators yes, on one module. Exactly. There are two oscillators on this module more or less identical except they both start at a sine wave this one goes to a sawtooth and the bottom one will go to a square and we're not really hearing the square i'm sending the, the top oscillator to um, the dynamics manager which is being controlled by the quad function generator but i'm kind of just letting things pass through right now so we can just hear the oscillator but if we were to hear the envelopes you know we can hear things like this you know uh, affecting the source sound Hit a button and you'll get your Buchla bongos going too, which is kind of nice. Um, but in any case, back to uh, frequency modulation, one of the things I love is just adding in that second source to modulate the first source, and then the first source is coming back to the second source to modulate it. And that's all controlled through these FM knobs, which is kind of sweet. So you're cross-modulating the two os oscillators against each other. Exactly, but we're only monitoring one. So we're monitoring the top oscillator here. And we could send the second oscillator straight to uh, the output, or the mixer. There we go. So now we hear the second oscillator as well. So that's kind of nice that all this wackiness just comes from two very basic oscillators and it's it's amazing how far you can push simplicity um, and I'm just turning the frequency modulation knobs right now I'm not changing any frequencies the frequencies are the large knobs and you have wave shape control as well so if we bring this into a square wave And of course, almost all of these parameters have CV control. 
The only one that doesn't is the FM knob. So that's your manual control here. Why doesn't FM have uh, CV control? It might just be a conscious decision mm -hmm. uh, with Don because I don't think any of his modules, uh, most of them have FM in, but none of them have the control, the CV control. I see. The CV control is always for the frequency or the waveform or the scaling of the, uh, of the frequency. So in his way of thinking, it's almost like FM was considered just to be a performance parameter. It was something that you would be using to yeah, be able to change the... Yeah, I don't want to second guess Don's brilliant mind. Sure. But, um, yeah, we could deduce something like that, I think. Interesting. Yeah, based on tradition and the fact that uh, that's the case with almost all of his modules. So I should backtrack for a second. This system is kind of a high... This is a 200E, a Buchla 200E, which is a modern recreation in the last 10 years, this is a, about a 10 year old system, but it's a recreation of, of uh, the Buchla 200 series from the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, a lot of the modules have digital components and you know, so you have a really high level of precision that you may not have had on the original system. Um, but also, I kind of missed that beautiful analog tone that we get from these 258. Uh, oscillators. So it was nice to add some of these clones back into the modern system and it really balances out the sound in my opinion. And I also have uh, a module here made by Eardrill, uh, Chris Muir uh, out of Alameda, California and uh, he has um, a third-party module called the Pendulum Ratchet and I have some of other some other of Chris's modules uh, as well. And this one here is from Sweden. Uh, it's uh, Vitexcapes. Uh, it's a filter, a feedback filter, multi-mode feedback filter. And so it's really nice to kind of mix and match and, and build a system that um, is akin to your own aesthetic. And uh, so getting back to it, here's our 258. And uh, we can jump to, well, since we're already connected, we've got our dynamics manager and our quad function generator which is a staple of the 200E series. Um, these are four envelope generators in one module and four dynamics managers in one module. And the dynamics managers have the famous uh, low-pass gate. Um, uh, can you explain what a dynamics manager is? Well, it's basically, um, if, I, if I turn off our oscillator here, and we just hear the pulsing, um, I'm not sending it any pulses now, so it went silent. One thing I love about this Dynamics Manager, and this may not explain what it is, but it's an amazing uh, feature, is that when this knob is all the way down at zero, we don't hear anything unless we send the uh, function generator a pulse. And then that pulse, uh, in turn, sends a CV message based on the attack and decay settings to the Dynamics Manager. So if I were to turn on the pendulum ratchet here to send a pulse, and I'm getting an irregular pulse because I've turned the density down. If I turn this up, we'll get a constant pulse. But it's kind of nice to pull the density back and add a little bit of randomness, and we still keep a rhythm. So what we're hearing now um, on the dynamics manager is strictly what's being sent to it from the function generator. If I turn these attack decays down, we get a much tighter percussive signal. If I open the decay, it's longer. If I increase the attack, we get rid of the uh, transient at the beginning. And we can change from low pass to a gate. And the gates are very fast on this system. Amazingly fast. Um, wow. That's an incredibly fast envelope. I, I, I love it. Very characteristic and really beautiful sound, yeah. Absolutely. And if I were to have one criticism, these envelopes don't go slow enough. Uh, at, the, at the opposite end, we only have 10 seconds of an attack. Mm. You might be able to scale that a little uh, greater um, with the negative voltage, but um, not so much. Um, I know this would kind of be blasphemy, but I have some depth for... Um ADSR modules that I've gone in and replaced the capacitors with different values to be able to change the timing coefficient. 
That's pretty deep. Yeah. That's nice. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it might be, it's exceedingly nerdy, and I think for something like this, that would almost be a crime against humanity, but it's nice to know that that's at least something to think about. That's right. That's right. Well, what's amazing about these clones is they do react to negative voltage. In fact, I can send this oscillator here a negative voltage and really slow it down. Um, So that's on a square, and those cycles are getting very, very slow now. That might, that might take about 40 seconds to cycle wow. a full square wave. So we'll hear a tick in about 20 seconds, and then another tick in 20 more seconds. But I love that. This is how I was able to slow this system down. And there we go. We start to hear it. That's going very slow. And I can demonstrate that later through the spectral processors. And using the slower modulations on the spectral processors, you get a very visual feedback and can really see what's going on. Wow. Um, but back to the dynamics manager. So there's our fast, our fast pulsing and gates and envelopes, right? But this, this knob here I love because it fades in the original source. And when I turn it all the way up, we don't hear the envelope anymore. So it crossfades between them. It's not necessarily crossfading, it's just bringing up the uh, base signal and it suddenly takes over the envelope. So if you pull this back, you'll start to hear the envelope again, which is nice. So if we slow this down, this will be a better demonstration. When we slow it down, we can fade up the space in between those pulses, which is very sweet. That's so cool. So there's my dynamics management. <laughs> it's not the most versatile module. You also have velocities. It's very basic, but it's a kind of basic essential module that doesn't really need to do anymore. Yeah. This is just absolutely what you need it to do. Um, and you do have an additional control here of velocities. So I could really quickly um, take the XY grid from this touch plate and um, let's take a look at the touch plate. So this is something that came with the unit when you bought it from well, Buchla? Well, it comes with this module in particular, which is the tactile input port module, the 223E. And this is the 222E, which works with both this module and the kinesthetic input port module, which I think is the 222, I believe. Um, but in any case, what's so cool about this velocity thing is that this pad here is now on an X, X grid, and I can bring up the volume, essentially, of that channel. And I can kind of fade it with my finger. It's almost like controlling this knob here, but not really. Um, it's a different kind of gain staging because we can just get the envelope as well. And we're not hearing that source fade up underneath the envelope like we would if we turn this knob. Um, so that's a really powerful thing. I use this a lot for just um, hands-on tactile control of an oscillator or a filter or whatever in performance. Wow. So it's, it's just a really quick way to do a, a nice assignment that way. Um, so that kind of uh, covers our 258, the quad function generator, the 281, which has our attack and decays, the quick ones. You can put these on self-oscillating as well, of course. Um, so now it's not getting a pulse. It's generating its own pulse. You can use that as a clock if you want. And what's, what's basically the timing is just simply the attack and decay. So you pick that up all the way, it's wow. almost an oscill you know, we're in amplitude oscillation range. So this can be very effective. You, you know, you can use it to drive uh, a sequencer or drive other uh, pulse-driven uh, modules. Um, pretty sweet. And again, there's your dynamics manager to just expose what's being fed underneath into, uh, uh, you know, the source before it hits the envelope. It's so nice to be able to fade up that source. I love that feature. I haven't found anything on the Euro rack that really, okay, kill me now, but on my system, I haven't found <laughs> anything that really does that, the equivalent of, of what this dynamics manager does. Um, 
So if we back up a little bit or just look around to the system, we've got, so I might as well just go through and, and talk about each module before okay. demonstrating it. We've got the touch plate uh, interface here um, where you've got all your uh, pulses and CVs that can be sent from this device. And I love this device. We'll get to it later, but it's so sensitive. It's almost like tapping on a table. Um, and I, I kind of tap my best rhythms on a table. <laughs> and uh, so you're able to tap amazing rhythms and, and things like that. It's just so responsive. It's electricity. You know, it's not MIDI. Right. And, and excuse me, because it's only been five, six years. But I came from such a MIDI world and was limited by 128 steps, as we all are. Yeah. So you know, coming to electricity is just infinite. It's amazing and so fast incredibly fast um so yeah that's our touch port this is um, a modern day oscillator let me um actually just hook this one up this is um don's 261 e which is called the complex waveform generator and uh so we still have our envelope but i'm gonna just expose the raw source here this has a bunch of timbral controls um and a principal oscillator much like the 258, it's got two oscillators, but this time one is deemed a modulation oscillator and the other is deemed a principal oscillator. And this, this is our modulation control here, so that factors in this secondary modulation source that is frequency modulating the principal oscillator here. And here we have other controls like symmetry, high order. If you, turn all these, if, you, if you turn all these down, you get something that's close to a, uh, to a sine wave or, or maybe a triangle wave. Yeah, probably more like a triangle wave. And we have a sine wave output here that has no modulation. So there's our sine. And um, these controls don't affect that output. It's just a pure sine wave which can be very handy for things. So you can actually have two outputs, one that's complex and the other that's just simply a sine wave. And I take it this is a digital oscillator? Yes, yes, indeed. You know, Don would be the first person to argue that none of this is digital, right? Mm. It's all analog because it's tactile, your hands are on it, you're using cables, etc., etc. But we all know, underneath the hood, it's a computer. Yeah. It's got, you know, A to D, D to A conversion. So it really, yeah, it's a digital thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, however, I love digital plus analog. Um, you get the best of both worlds that way. So yeah, the, uh, the digital oscillator, you know, some people may not appreciate them, but when you combine them with the analog clones, this system, just it, it just broadens the palette that much more and so you're getting some of the classic Buchla sounds here with the clones and some of the newer uh, more you know precision controlled sounds here with the analog or the uh, digital oscillator the 261 complex waveform generator was Don annoyed when you uh, bought a case that was bigger than just the modules that you bought from him, knowing that you would be putting other people's uh, stuff in as well? Well, I didn't know that initially. I wound up buying a system that was pretty much populated. It had, I think, four panels that were blank. And, uh, but otherwise, it was all 200E modules. Uh -huh. And I have to say that, you know, there's not many places you can go around and check this stuff out at a store, right? And, you know, so I went to some of my friend's house, like Chris Muir, he gave me a nice demo. He showed me some of these clones that he had as well. And so that kind of put the bug in my ear. And yeah, um, you know, I love the analog tones combined with the digital tones. It just gives you a very, very broad palette to work with. Um, in fact, you were asking, you know, whether Don was concerned what because I didn't populate the entire system. Well, I didn't have enough money to populate the entire system. <laughs> you know, I knew that would come eventually. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, when I did finally get the bug in my ear about these analog oscillators, you know, my first question to Don was, hey, why aren't you making your old 258s? Because they're compatible with the 200E, you know? And he said, oh, I've already done that. 
And, um, and I was like, but you know, you're, you're forcing me to buy a clone module. Uh, because I want that analog sound, and I'm going to get that analog sound. <laughs> and he was just like, oh, you know, I did that. I'm doing other things now. And you know, I, I thought, you know, yeah, he did it, and it's beautiful. Why not just, you know, you've done it. Great. So let others have it, you know, or let others buy it. It um, sounds to me like Don was more of an artist than a businessman. <laughs> oh, he really was, man. You know, it's funny. I sent him, I sent him checks for the system, and he lost both of them. <laughs> Um, I wound up sending them, you know, four checks all together. Um, but yeah, so it kind of funny. Um, so yeah, moving on here to another analog oscillator. This uh -huh. one is the uh, 262V, also by Mark Verbos. And this is our harmonic oscillator. And you can get this in Eurorack format. Verbos Electronics has an amazing array of Buchla inspired modules. Um, and this is a good little demo of what the harmonic oscillator can do. Wow. Um, we have the uh, center frequencies here. We can har do the harmonic scan. And we also can tilt. We have spectral tilt. So between all this, we have CB control, of course. We've got individual control of all of the frequencies, all of the harmonics. It's very, very powerful. In fact, you can assign CV inputs to move each of these faders. Each of these faders has its own output. You know, it's very, very powerful. Lots of options here. Its own audio outputs? So its you own can... audio output. So there are eight, there are 10 audio outputs that are all individual to these frequencies or these harmonics. And then there's the, the, the uh, mixed output, which is what happens here when we play with the faders and mix that. And we can do that with CVs as well. If I was to just take this output, we hear that harmonic, this harmonic, and the fader doesn't do anything. It's just a hardwired right. output of that, of that harmonic based on the position of the frequency bass. It's fun. I'm a, I'm a Hammond organ player. I don't know if you know that, but mm -hmm. um, th that's exactly how you do the, the signal shaping for that instrument. Is ex it's exactly the same thing. Right, with the draw bars. With the draw yes. bars. They're the same thing where you're pulling, to, pulling out different harmonics and you get different timbres as a result. And then the pitch, is, the pitch comes from the note that you're striking it's on the such on the an keyboard. amazing instrument. I love yeah. that. Yeah. My God. Beautiful instrument. And this also has a frequency modulation input, which I'm modulating so cool. here with this oscillator, or another 258. I don't think you could have enough 258s. I really love these, these oscillators. Wow. And they feel so good. I mean, they just feel great. You know, the one thing about the Bukla is, you know, your fingers aren't, you know, trying to fit over these tiny little knobs. Yeah, we have right. our share of tiny knobs, but there's a lot of real estate to work with here. Um, now, explain that to me for a sec. So your Iraq is 3U, yes, correct? Yes, this is a 5U. It's a 5U. Mm -hmm. So this is the same physical size as like a Moog modular That's or right. a Synthesizers.com modular, something like yeah, that. Yeah, Blasset and mm -hmm. Friend, all these do 5U. I think even Surge does 5U as well. That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, do you know if those other instruments are compatible with this as far as voltage and stuff? I or is this don't really... believe so. The Surge, I think, is a 1 volt per octave. The Bukla is 1.2 volts per octave, uh -huh. which always, you know, I think it's great because the math works fine if you're working with Western equal tempered music, 12 tone scales, 1.2, you know, is like an octave, 12 tones. Sure. Right? Um, so it really, you don't have to get out the calculator like you would with um, one volt per octave. And I always thought that was funny because Don kind of skewed the keyboard, you know? Um, he didn't want a keyboard because he wanted to point this stuff to the future. But I thought it was kind of funny or interesting that he went with 1.2 volts per octave. I think it's great. It's great. Um, but I, it was kind of, it's a head scratcher a little bit. Um, but in any case, uh, back to this world, um, the harmonic oscillator has hardwired outputs as far as uh, waveforms. So we have a square here, we have a triangle here, and I've got the frequency modulation. So here's our triangle, here's our square, um, and here's our sawtooth. And you can change 
the harmonics, I thought it was just a sine, well no, I thought it was just a square wave, but you can change the harmonics, the harmonic structure of all of those different no, uh, waveforms. No, forms. actually. The, the only one that you can change the harmonic structure of is this mixed output right here that has the arrow. These are all hardwired outputs uh, based on the bass frequency Got that it. have no effect from the faders. Got so it. We have a lot of hardwired outputs on this module. Um, but the, the key is this one here, and when you start, when you turn up your harmonic scanner, the width, as you see that expand, you see that width expand across all that, Yeah. Um, you get a really hot output, and you can get distortion. Um, but that's alright, it's a good kind of distortion, so I, I usually pull it back to about here, and then I can play around with all these harmonics, wow. which is kind of nice. It's just, there is so much power, and it, for an analog oscillator, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's incredible, it really is. And, and combined with all this stuff, it, it, it's endless. You, you can just have endless options, endless fun. I mean, you're always discovering something new.